Hello, everyone, and welcome to Binocular Vision Part 3 of my series of three lectures. And today I'll be speaking on managing binocular vision disorders. I'm Dr. Hilary Geiser. I'm an assistant professor at the New England College of Optometry. And I look forward to speaking with you today on the topic of um, vision therapy and managing binocular vision disorders. So welcome, everyone, and thank you to Orbis for letting me present today. So today's lecture objectives, uh, managing binocular vision disorders, um, vision therapy is a huge topic and I'm just going to do a, a quick um, introduction to the topic and more of a basis of a primary, from primary care optometry. So today's lecture objectives are to learn how to manage common near binocular vision disorders, focusing on near, these are the ones that um, most commonly impact, for example, a student's ability to do well at school or can impact a person at work. Um, you're also going to learn how to perform common vision therapy techniques. Again, there's hundreds of different vision therapy techniques out there, focusing ones that are more easy to implement from more of a primary care perspective that don't involve a lot of cost and are easy, fairly easy and portable to take um, with you wherever you need to go. Um, and I'm also going to cover how to manage convergence and sufficiency with vision therapy. Convergence and sufficiency is one of the most common binocular vision disorders. And we, as primary care optometrists, need to be able to manage this appropriately. So I just want to get a gauge from the audience. I'm going to ask you two questions here um, regarding your comfort level in the management of binocular vision disorders. And I'm not, and first of all, I want to know what is your comfort level with binocular vision disorders that are not vision therapy? Okay, and so I see there's a variety in the audience, some not comfortable at all, some very comfortable. Majority are occasionally managed some, but not all binocular vision disorders. So I hope this lecture helps you today. And now I want to know what is your comfort level in implementing vision therapy? Good, so it's great. So I see, again, wide range in the audience, but the majority have learned about vision therapy, but have never implemented. And so I hope this lecture will be very good um, and very informative for you. Um, again, doing more from a primary care perspective, some things that are simple and easy to implement um, um, with your patients. Again, at this is just such a wide topic. I'm unable to cover everything in only 15 minutes today, but I just wanted to give you some binocular vision management resources that are very handy. Um, first two favorites of mine are Clinical Management of Binocular Vision from Scheinman and Wick. Um, very great book, very comprehensive, walks you through all the procedures, management, diagnoses, and also a good source of evidence-based uh, convergence and sufficiency treatment is uh, the Manuals of Procedure from the Convergence and Sufficiency Treatment Trials of the CITT studies. Highly recommend you to read their work, very informative, very good um, evidence-based method of treating convergence and sufficiency. Um, some other sources here. I just want to include a couple um, sites for some vision therapy equipment. Don't have to buy from these, obviously, but just some good resources if you feel like this would be helpful for you. So the common near binocular vision disorders that I'm going to focus, again, limited time, I'm going to focus on only four today, but focusing on ones that impact your patients at near. These are going to include convergence insufficiency, ocular motor dysfunction, convergence excess, and convergence insufficiency. So I'm going to hop right in and get started with the management of accommodative insufficiency. Accommodative insufficiency, we find these the symptoms include blur, headaches, um, all these difficulties with reading, um, shifting focus, words might be moving on the page, and when we're doing our workup, we're finding reduced findings with minus lenses, reduced amplitude accommodation. Um, if you want to know a little bit more about this, please see my previous lectures where I covered more of the diagnosis and the testing to, to um, come up with a diagnosis of the different binocular vision disorders. So just touching briefly on that. So how do we manage accommodative insufficiency? 
we're going to first start with correcting any refractive error, even if it seems small. This is a good starting point. Sometimes even that small prescription for glasses can help. And then addition lenses are a good starting point. These lenses typically range from 0.75 to plus 2. So we really need to make sure we're doing a good trial, putting them in a trial frame, gauging our patient comfort, have them perhaps read a little bit in the waiting room with these lenses on and see how well they do. With that said, this is our typical starting point, but additional vision therapy can make the treatment with lenses even more effective. And um, just don't think that you're just going to focus on your accommodative um, treatments, accommodative vision therapy. We also need to work convergences as well. So in all of these, we need to make sure both the accommodative system and the virgin, virgin system is being trained. We just don't want to focus solely on one or the other. We're going to go into ocular motor dysfunction next. Signs include difficulties with pursuits, saccades, fixation. Um, often parents are come in and say, my child's been referred for a tracking problem. They're having a hard time reading uh, without using a finger, having a hard time looking to the board and copying back down to a paper, for example, lose their place frequency. Often there's a lot of head movements when reading. Um, and when we're doing our exam, we're finding that it was often poor fixation during our cover tests or other tests. Um, they might do poorly on the DEM test, um, and they often use a, might use a finger to help direct fixation. Ocular motor dysfunction is associated with other binocular and accommodative anomalies frequently, so we just need to be able um, to ferret that out, to do our testing and see if there's any associated um, binocular vision or accommodative anomalies with the ocular motor dysfunction. How do we manage ocular motor dysfunction? The key is that addition lens is typically not helpful at all unless there might be an associated accommodative data problem, then might, they might be helpful. Um, so steer away typically from addition lenses. Uh, vision therapy is the treatment of choice. We need to oppose both accommodative virg and virgins techniques, monocular and binocular techniques. It's really important um, in ocular motor dysfunction, typically uh, because it's so associated with reading and tracking and schoolwork, so that there's communication to everyone involved in the child's education. There's letters sent to the teachers. Um, parents understand um, the condition as well, so that everyone's on the same page. If uh, something that might be helpful before the vision therapy, you start the vision therapy, is some compensating strategies. These can be using a finger or a ruler to underline sentences, help with that tracking when the child's learning how to read. I'm just gonna cover again, lots of different um, methods of doing vision therapy for ocular motor dysfunction. I'm just going to focus on a few today. These include letters circling, slash filling in letters, visual tracing, MARD symbol. And then I threw in this, sometimes we do need to worry about suppression. Um, I'm gonna teach you um, how to do a, a vision therapy technique to help with suppression called the red green glasses and flashlight. So letter circling. Letter circling is going to help improve smooth pursuits, saccades, and tracking. Um, the procedure is, I have an example here. You can use different um, print out, printouts with different letters, use a magazine, you know, something with appropriate size print for the, the patient involved. And you're going to have them either circle or fill in the letter, like fill in the O's, fill in the P's. E's and O's do work best because of their frequency and other vowels. What you're going to have the patient do, you're going to have them put an eye patch on, they're going to start monocularly, they're going to follow around and circle all the letters that you indicate or fill in all the letters that you indicate. And then you're going to have them do, say, a paragraph of similar length if you're using a magazine or you can use the pre-printed sheets that I have. You're going to record the time it takes and record as well the number of the mistakes. 
and so you're going to be training your, your patient how to do this and when mistakes are minimized and they're, they're sort of reaching a timing plateau, then you can remove the eye patch and they can proceed from doing this task monocularly to binocularly to increase the difficulty level. Another technique is visual tracing or visual scanning, psychotic workbooks. There's a lot, mazes, whereas water books, there's a lot of different things you can do in this category to help with your ocular motor function. Again, the goal of visual tracing is to improve smooth pursuits and tracking. Lots of different workbooks. I just have a sample today of um, some visual scanning books psychotic workbooks, lots of different things. You can use different mazes, um, even those were Waldo's books, anything really that gets the, the patient looking and tracking um, that you can get some measure on. Then we always start monocularly and then progress binocularly because it's harder binocularly. You can have the patient, they're really struggling at the beginning, starting with a pencil to help with that tracking and then progress to using their eyes only. And again, working through the, book, uh, the books binocularly without mistakes is the, the end point, starting out monocularly, then moving to binocularly um, without mistakes. Uh, another technique that you can use for ocular motor dysfunction is something called a Marsden ball. Um, I have just an example here that, um, that it just hangs from the ceiling. Um, this one doesn't have any letters and numbers, but you can put them on, you can put different colors and whatnot. And this technique helps the patient develop appropriate ocular motor coordination. There's lots of different things you can do with this. Um, so lots of different techniques if you, if you look on, uh, online or read some of the literature, lots of different um, variations. I'm just going to include two today. One is called the circle technique. You suspend the ball, the patient stands in the middle. So you're going to swing the ball around their head, make sure there's enough clearance so it doesn't hit the patient. And the patient's going to do is they're going to track the ball. And then when it goes behind the their head, you're going to train them to saccad over, and then they're going to keep tracking the ball, look over, follow the ball, look over, and then you can reverse directions. It just helps them with their tracking. They can also do something called batting or bunting. They're going to hold a little bat, and this is particularly good if they have, if you have different numbers and letters on the Marston ball. They're going to be call out a number, letter, say A, they're going to try and find and hit the A on the ball, um, again, to help with tracking and finding those, those different targets and then moving their body and hitting that target. You do colors on the ball, different letters, different numbers. There's, there's a wide variety. It's a really good um, technique just because there's so many different things you can think of to do with it. The end point would be that we're going to start easy. You're going to have them just start tracking and following the ball, then increase to where they're hitting numbers, and they start monocularly and then progress binocularly. Um, and the end point is really if they can bunt the ball, uh, contact the appropriate number of letters, colors when called with minimal time and effort with both eyes open. So next I'm going to go into just one of many, many techniques to work on patient suppression. The purpose of the red, green glasses and pen light um, technique is to decrease the intensity and frequency of suppressions. You're going to start with conditions that are going to cause the patient to be in a state where they're least likely to suppress and then they're going to move on to more normal conditions. In this technique, the patient's going to wear their red, green glasses. They're going to hold a six prism diopter base down prism before the dominant eye. They're going to view a pin light in distance. You're going to ask them how many colors and lights are synced. And you want them to maintain diplopia. You want them not to be suppressing an eye. So you're going to probe them for questions. How many colors are you seeing? How many lights are you seeing? You want to make sure that they're seeing two. 
And then you're going to slowly increase the room illumination because that will make it harder to um, not suppress. And then when they're able to do that with the full room illumination on, then you remove the red green glasses and then you have them do it just with the prism. And if they're having trouble, if they're suppressing, you're going to decrease that room lighting a little until the focus is noted and then slowly increase with the goal being that they're maintaining um, diplopia double vision and full room illumination and not suppressing. This, this endpoint typically requires about two to four weeks of in office and home therapy. And again, the goal is when the patient can maintain that diplopia without the red green glasses and in normal room illumination. There's lots of different techniques that fall into this category. Another one being, um, there's um, playing cards, red green playing cards. These are great for, for more take home um, therapy. They put on the glasses, you're only able to see what the cards say if you're not suppressing and using both eyes with the red green glasses. Play some games, good way of training um, the visual system to not suppress. So that's just an, an option. Lots of different, um, again, lots of different techniques in this category. So you can choose one that's um, easy for your, that you would think would be easy for your patients to use. I'm just using a couple of examples. So next I'm going to transition into convergence access management. Signs of convergence or symptoms of convergence excess include very similar to symptoms to accommodative insufficiency, along with maybe potentially holding that reading material very close. They might close an eye or they might also have a um, head tilt after visual fatigue. Signs include esophoria near, greater at near than distance, with also a high ACA ratio, low divergence ranges, high convergence ranges, normal NPC, and they might have trouble on minus lenses. And there's also frequently an associated accommodative excess with this uh, condition as well. So in convergence excess, we're going to try to start with some glasses, correct any refractive error, even if it's minimal. Sometimes this can help. Plus lenses, may or may not be helpful. Always need to be careful prescribing um, plus with convergence excess. Um, if the patient has mesophoria, that's really where you want to start out and focus on eliminating first, um, if that's present. And always must trial frame and follow them um, quite closely just to see if this is working. The um, treatment of choice, management of choice is vision therapy for convergence excess. And we're going to be work, and you would work with the patient on improving their relaxation of accommodation, and also working on divergence techniques. So I covered um, so far accommodative insufficiency, ocular motor dysfunction, and convergence access. Some of the more common findings. I'm now going to transition into convergence insufficiency, where I'll be spending the majority of the time on um, a vision therapy program is again this is one of the most common binocular vision disorders and the one I think they'll be most likely to treat in more of a primary care setting. So symptoms include double vision, eye strain, headaches, avoidance of these near point tasks. They're going to have that classic preceded near point of convergence exophora greater at near than distance, low positive fusional divergence is based on shares criteria, low ACA ratio, and difficulty or inability to pull plus lenses of an ocular accommodated facility. Again, all of these I, I covered in my previous lectures on diagnoses and um, methods of evaluating for binocular vision disorders in my part one and part two lectures. So if you are interested, you can always follow up and um, watch those. Often associated with convergence insufficiency is an associated accommodative dysfunction. So we need to make sure we're ruling that out as well. 
So how do we manage insufficiency, the convergence insufficiency? I mentioned the CITT studies, the convergence insufficiency treatment all studies, very good resources on what does and what does not work for CI. Um, out of the, these studies, um, home, home slash office based vision therapy is really the treatment of choice. They recommended, uh, out of this, this, uh, this research, they recommended a program of 12 weeks of good compliance, might go even to 24 weeks with moderate to poor compliance. Um, recommend one hour office visits every one to two weeks where you're working with the patient in office with vision therapy to monitor their programs. You would implement changes. For example, if the patient's doing really well, they reach their endpoints for monocular training on St. Martin's and Bowl, for example. You would then implement the change that they would now go binocular. And um, they also looked at all the, the home treatments and found that 15, about 15 to 20 minutes of homework or vision training at home, five days a week, also is very useful for managing convergence and sufficiency. So really need that component of an office and at home to really um, reach peak um, management. Um, so just a word about glasses and convergence and sufficiency. Glasses are not the treatment of choice can make it frequently worse unless there's an associated accommodative insufficiency. We're going to go, if you're thinking back to my previous lectures, a little bit, um, make sure we're ruling out pseudo-CI first. But in some rare instances, glasses may work. Again, we would have to trial frame, repeat a binocular vision testing, really make sure that this is appropriate for the patient. But vision therapy is the treatment of choice. Again, sometimes, and this is not um, this is not for everyone, based in prism with or without plus may work in certain cases. If you're thinking about including this, must always complete a, a prism adaptation test first. And when you're prescribing, you're going to start with the least amount of prism that satisfied shows criterion and split that prism between the two eyes. Again, always making sure that you're doing a trial frame for comfort. And it's typically not successful if the patient is greater than 10 to 12 prism diopters. It's just not typically going to work. So again, going back, um, vision therapy is really the treatment of choice based on the literature. Um, I recommended at the beginning the manuals and procedures from the CITT studies, really good resource available on the web um, to really outline a good vision therapy program for a CI. Lots of different techniques in there. I'm only going to cover a few and really I'm doing a more simplified version of this today to share with you. Um, a good resource there. In this um, vision therapy management for CI, there's multiple stages and each multiple techniques and each technique has a specifically stated endpoint and I'm going to share that with you today. And then going back to that home therapy, there should be about those about three tasks for a total of 15 to 20 minutes, five days a week with your follow-up. You don't want to make it too long. We want to make sure our patients can complete that home therapy. Um, it is work. It's really hard work for a child to do, for example. And so keeping it to that 15, 20 minutes instead of 30 minutes or, or an hour just makes the, and improves the compliance, which really helps with treatment. So when we're talking CI and vision therapy, we need a program to develop not just the virgin disease, we also need to focus on the accommodative um, system as well, as well as ocular motility and suppression. So today, and again, only have time to cover a sampling of different vision therapy procedures and more from a prime, focusing more on a primary care perspective. So for virgences, I'm going to discuss how to do rock string, loose prisms, lightsaber cards, and eccentric circles today. And for accommodation, we're going to work on monocular and binocular chart rock and monocular and binocular lens rock. 
I already covered the technique for ocular motility when I discussed ocular motor dysfunction. We're going to include those very same um, training exercises into our vision therapy for CI. And I also covered the suppression, one of the techniques to um, train for suppression with the red green glasses and flashlight, and you can incorporate that into your CI vision therapy. This is just outlining the sequence of training. I'm going to go into more of a three-phase technique in a little later, but just thinking about which techniques are a little bit easier to start with and which are harder. So, so for virgins, typically going to start with your box strain and proceed to your lifesaver cards, eccentric circles, and loose prisms. For ocular motor, again, starting with a little bit more of the easier techniques of circling, filling in the beads, and progressing to the Marsden ball. And the same for accommodation. We always start monocularly before we train binocularly. So I'm just going to get started with training the, with working with the different virgins techniques you can do. I'm going to cover broad string as I mentioned earlier, followed by lightsaber cards and eccentric circles, and then loose prisms. So Brock String is one I've been around for, for quite a while, um, quite common, still works well. Um, I have an example right here to show with you today. So uh, the purpose of the Brock String is to help develop the patient's ability to voluntarily converge, diverge, and to develop a normal NPC. Very simple, it's one meter of strings with two beads, um, red bean, bead and green bean. So, some also have a yellow um, bead in, in the middle. Um, so you're gonna have the red bead set at the end of the string at one meter, and you're gonna start the green bead at 40 centimeters. You're gonna have the patient, sometimes you need a tie end of the string to a doorknob or have an assistant help with the, the end of the string that you're going to hold the box string out you're going to hold that bead at 40 centimeters and you're going to have the patient look at the green bead and describe and, and really probe them and encourage them to describe what they're seeing at this point of this technique the patient should report one green bead and two red beads or otherwise they should be noting or describing physiological problem. And they should be reporting that the strings are crossing at the brain. So you might need to um, be a little involved, point to the green beads, say, what do you see? Um, how many, maybe ask how many beads you're seeing. And what are the strings doing? Can you describe what the strings are doing? So again, just thinking about um, appropriate language to use with different age patients when you're doing the technique. After you've um, established that the, the green bead is single and the strings are crossing when they're looking at the green bead, you're going to have them switch fixation to the red bead. And then again, you're going to probe them and ask them what they're saying. At this point, the green bead should be double and the red single. Again, physio they're noting physiological diplopia. And you're going to instruct the patient to always try to make the strings Cross at the bead. Once the patient's able to fuse that near and far beads, you're going to have them maintain fixation on the near bead for five seconds and then switch to the far bead and maintain for five seconds. So that's a cycle. So one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. That's a cycle. If the patient's having trouble fusing the near and far beads, you can have them touch the bead, and this allows the kinesthetic feedback, helps them um, integrate uh, their space into what they're seeing. You can also use my binocular minus lenses to help stimulate convergence if they're really having difficulty. I'm going to go into all these cues for feedback when you're doing vision therapy and ways to make tasks um, techniques more difficult or easier for a patient at the end. So stay tuned for that. Just giving you the basic procedures and 
Um, I'm really designing this so you could print out these slides and, and use them as procedure techniques. No, they're a little bit wordy. I, I, I planned it that way so you could print them out and use them when you're doing your revision therapy. Anyways, the, after you do a cycle, you're going to have the patient perform 10 cycles near bead, green bead, red bead, green bead, red bead. After 10 cycles, you're going to have them move the bead 40 centimeters closer and repeat. Again, we're starting at 40 centimeters. And the goal is to be able to move the bead to 5 centimeters away from the, um, the nose and be able to converge and diverge, um, converge and diverge for um, distance for 10 cycles comfortably. So the goal is to start at 40, move it gradually to 5 centimeters, and be able to fuse both the near and the far bead for 10, yeah, um, 10 cycles comfortably. Something else you can also use is you can do bug on a string, which means you're just pulling one of those beads along and you're having the patient focus on it. That, that technique also works well. It might be a little bit easier for younger patients. Next, I'm going to cover lifesaver cards. These are relatively easy to obtain. Um, they come in a transparent and a white card version. Transparent card, just because it's transparent, Transparent helps patients learn divergence a little bit easier. Um, some patients have a hard time diverging with the white card. The purpose of the lightsaber cards is to increase the amplitude of the negative fusional virgins and positive fusional virgins, decrease the latency of the fusional virgins response, and increase the velocity of the fusional virgins response. So in this procedure, the target separations are already printed on the cards. The patient's simply going to start at the bottom. They're going to try to fuse for 10 seconds and then jump to the next target and fuse. So it already has those gradations on the cards. This is typically a good place to start after the patient has been successful with rock strength therapy. Um, the end point is when the patient can achieve clear chiastopic or convergence and orthopic or divergence fusion with all the targets on the cards, and then be able to switch between the two types of fusions with all the targets on the um, lifesaver cards, and then maintain fusion with the targets when they're being moved. Um, you can move those cards laterally or in a circle. The patient's able to switch between the two types of fusion. Um, and move the, the cards laterally, then that's a really good endpoint um, for this procedure. A technique. The next technique I'm going to cover is called eccentric circles. I have some of these today. They also come in a white and a transparent version. Again, the transparent ones help with divergence, the white leaves with convergence. Um, you can also use the transparent for convergence. Purpose, um, it's very similar, just like lightsaber cards, but these are typically a, a next level of, of difficulty. Is to increase, again, that amplitude of negative and positive, positive fusional virgins, and really decrease the latency and velocity, uh, or decrease the latency of the fusional virgins response, and increase the velocity. Patients gonna hold, um, they have A's and B's. I'm gonna start with the A's, hold them in front and they're going to encourage them to converge, you know, say, try to move your eyes, try to um, keep the center target clear. So in these, for example, most of the cards have some sort of anti-suppression, some are red-green for anti-suppression and or accommodative cues. This one has, um, it says clear here, so you have the patient keep it clear. That's going to help control accommodation. L's are held together, and when they're converging, they should perceive with the inner circles floating closer, and when they're diverging, the patients are going to perceive the outer circle um, floating away. And then when you reverse it, and you hold the B's together, that orientation should be um, switched. Uh, people commonly think that A's are for convergence and B's are for divergence. That's not necessarily the case. 
on, you can do both. You're just going to have to really um, work with your patient so they understand which one should be coming closer and which one further away. Um, so in this technique, it, unlike the lifesaver cards where it has the separation on the cards, we do need to, um, you're going to have the patient hold them and fuse and then slowly, slowly bring them apart. And that separation is you can calculate into um, prism diameter. So at 40 centimeters, one millimeter equals from prism diopter. So in the case of the separation of 12 centimeters, that's a 30 prism diopter demand. So the whole goal is that the patient should be able to converge with a card separation of 12 centimeters and diverge with a card separation of six centimeters and be able to switch between the two types of fusion um, with cards held at six centimeters. And to maintain the fusion with a card separation of six centimeters while moving them laterally or in a circle and still being able to appropriately converge in that range. So next up is uh, our loose prisms. These are typically the next level in difficulty for the virgins training wide variety. Um, I have an example here because you can use lens and trial lens sets as well. This is simply going to help increase the patient's ability to converge and diverge. You're going to have a 20-40 size target at three meters, some intermediate distance, and at 40 centimeters. And you're going to typically start with a four prism diopter base out prism before the right eye and look at the distant target and try to make the double image into one. When the image is single, they're going to remove the prism and repeat the procedure. You can keep doing that 10 times. Have them look away, single, 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 and you're going to repeat that for have them. Um, work on fusing and repeat that procedure 10 times. I'm going to repeat that from distance to an intermediate and near target. And when the patient is successful, um, you're going to, you're going to, first you're going to repeat and switch the orientation of the prism. So I was doing base out before. I'm going to move and do base in and repeat for 10, 10 times. And when the patient successfully, you're going to repeat the sequence, but increase the prism by multiple steps before. So if I was doing four base out, I'm going to now do eight base out if I was successful with the base out. If they're having a little bit of trouble going to that next four prism diopter step, you can go halfway and go on two prism diopter steps. And your end point for this technique is when the patient can successfully fuse 20 base out at all distances, 12 base in at intermediate at near, and 8 base in at distance. So if you see there's slightly different endpoints, so when you're increasing the prism by multiple rules of four, obviously for base out, it's going to be easier, and then you're going to probably go by two prism diopter steps for, for base in. And these make great, these are make great um, take home therapy techniques. Okay, great. I'm going to go into some accommodative techniques next. These are going to include monocular letter chart rock, monocular lens rock, binocular letter chart rock, and binocular lens rock. So monocular letter chart rock, rock the goal is to restore normal monocular accommodative amplitude and facility. You're going to start with the left eye occluded. You're going to typically have a chart with 20, 40 distance letter, letters. Some, um, some people in the literature recommend 20, 30. Um, just letting you know there's a little bit of a variation here. But typically a chart with 20, 40 distance letters, 10 lines of five letters each per line. Um, and you're going to hold that 40 centimeters from the patient. So they're going to hold one. 
You're also going to have one farther away on the wall. And the patient's going to start a little bit closer and then back away until those. So you're going to put the chart up. The patient's going to see that they're clear. You're going to have them back away until the letters become blurry. And then they're going to walk a little bit forward. Or they have reached a distance of three meters and the letters are still the patient's going to hold that small chart of 20, 40 year letters at 40 centimeters, and they're going to call off the letters on the top line while moving the chart closer. When the patient can't keep those letters clear, they're going to move that chart um, a little bit further away. So you're seeing that they're really um, going from the far chart until it's blurry and a little bit closer, and we're doing the same thing in here. You're gonna bring it until it's a little bit blurry, and then you're gonna bring it a little bit further away. So this is the distance that you wanna use for this step. So then they can um, then shift focus. They're gonna read the first line of the distance chart. They're gonna start, and they're gonna look at the first line of the distance chart, and they're gonna read one letter off the distance chart and one letter off the near chart until all the lines are complete. Sometimes if they're having a hard time doing this, they'll start with lines. They might be able to start reading one line at distance, one line at near, and then you're going to go to one letter, one letter. Again, just thinking of ways to make this a little bit easier at first so we don't frustrate our patients and then increasing the difficulty level. So after they've done the chart, they've read a letter at far, read a letter, read a letter at near, they're going to repeat this procedure, but with the right eye occluded, and with the left eye doing the work. The end point of this technique is when the patient can successfully clear the near chart at a distance that's equal to the age appropriate amplitude and clear the distance chart at three meters. So again, when I was telling you how they were walking up to, um, walking away to the chart and then walking a little closer, if that distance isn't quite three, mil three meters, we're going to be working on this each time they're in for therapy until they can come back and hold that near chart at an appropriate distance and be three meters away from the distance chart. And still maintaining focus while switching between the two charts. Next technique is um, monocular lens rock, and this is going to help norm normalize the accommodative amplitude and facility. We're going to include, again, we're always starting monocularly and then proceeding binocularly for these techniques. Patient's left eye is going to be occluded. We're going to hold some age-appropriate reading material at four centimeters and using some lenses um, or flippers to switch between and reading and ask the patient to clear the print while alternating between the two lenses. And then you're gonna have them switch eyes, occlude, since they're starting with the right, you're gonna have them um, occlude the right and now go to the left. And you're gonna move through a series of lens designs to increase the difficulty. Okay. And I'm gonna go over the different um, types of lenses that you can use. For binocular letter chart rock, just like monocular chart rock that I described easier, we're going to go through the same procedures of having the distance chart and the near chart. But instead of having one eye covered, the patient's now going to do this technique with both eyes open. So again, know this is a little um, wordy. My goal is to have you be able to print this out and use this as a procedure reference guide when you're doing this technique. And the end point for binocular letter chart rock is the patient can successfully clear, clear the near chart at an appropriate distance for their age and clear the distance chart while maintaining focus switching between the two charts. And then binocular lens rock, just like monocular lens rock, except instead of having one eye occluded while they're doing it, they're going to do um, with both eyes open. And the goal is to have them be able to complete 20 cycles in one minute. So a cycle is plus minus, that's one cycle. The goal is to have them be able to do 20 cycles in about a minute.
These are some of the typical lens rack block designs. I'm going to start out with plus and minus 0.5 and then gradually progress to plus and minus 0.25. Max, plus is going to max out at around plus 250. And then you can increase the minus up to negative six, and then you're going to go in 0.5 diopter steps. So, say you're at minus plus and minus 0.250, then you're going to go to plus 250, minus three, plus 250, minus 350, and so on and so forth. Um, with these flippers, flippers, you can order them in basically any power that you want. If you don't have flippers, you can also just use these lenses and switch between the two. Um, very portable, easy technique to do. So I was going to discuss some vision therapy feedback mechanisms. A communication is so key with your patients when you're performing these techniques. Um, and particularly children might not always understand what you're, you're asking them or what you do wanting them to do. So I'm just going to go through some of the different feedback mechanisms just so you can have an understanding of, of what's going on and, and how you can um, guide the vision therapy. So some of the, the key mechanisms just to be aware and to think about is the concept of diplopia of poor double vision. This is usually typically the easiest cue to explain to patients. Um, and this is great. To, to stress when using the Brock string and that physiological diplopia during Brock string. This is, um, again, just something you know. Is this double vision? Do you see two? Um, just so patients are aware of this. Blur is another cue that's very important um, to if they are either under or over focusing, for example, with eccentric circles. If that you can stress, oh, make sure you keep that clear so they really have a better understanding of what blur is and so they know when they're going on in their normal day-to-day -day life they, they have an understanding when they're progressing through vision therapy they have an understanding of what blur is suppression is also something we need to stress this can vary between the training implements usually if you're, you're doing um suppression uh, therapy to treat suppression depending on the method that you're using um, Right eye red, left eye green. Be like, oh, are you seeing? What are you, what are you seeing? And your patients are always saying, seeing red, for example, on the playing card, you know they're suppressing their left eye. So this can vary between the different implements. So you just need to be aware of what you're using so you can remind your patient of the cues to pay attention to. Luster is an interesting concept. It's that combination of colors when the patient's asked to use them. Um, this can um, happen, for example, on board four dot. That's just what comes to my mind right now. And a lack of luster, a lack of combination of the colors can indicate that the patient might see processing. And aesthetic awareness is also um, important. It's an understanding of the feelings, like how are you describing, how are you converging and diverging? What are your eyes doing? What does that feel, feel like? Just think about how you're going to explain that and stress that to your patient. You're feeling like you're pulling your eyes in um, or relaxing your eyes a little bit. Another concept that's um, more related to perceptual changes is the concept of silo or small in and large out. These are perceptual changes that occur while fusing and do while fusing and divergence and convergence demand is varied. Um, target doesn't always work for everyone, but the target might. When, it, when you're progressing through therapy and you're asking about um, how do things look, the target might appear to become smaller and move closer to the patient when converging and larger and further away with diverging. This is something you can use when you're asking, oh, what does the target look like it's doing? Do you notice anything? They're reporting that it's becoming smaller and moving closer. You can help them correlate that with convergence. Or, oh, you're moving your eyes, you're bringing your eyes together, you're converging. Um, when they're reporting this response. Float is associated with silo. That's when the, you're converging the targets appearing to float closer and, and diverging to targets appearing to float or go further away. 
Localization is a concept where, the, where you're able to point to where the target appears to be when fusion occurs in space. This is based on the concept of physiologic diplopia, um, and the pointer should be in the area where the visual axis cross. They will, when the pointer is in the area where the visual axis cross, they will see one target in the pointer. Example is this, the broad string when they're say, pointing to the bead where they're converging. So just, um, I know this, these concepts can be um, a little deep. Um, well, question three, true or false, is, is luster, uh, the lack of luster can indicate that the patient uh, may be suppressing, true or false. Good, good, everyone who's paying attention, almost everyone got it. The answer is true. So just, um, just going to wrap up the lecture for today in regards to vision training, uh, vision therapy with convergence and sufficiency. Pencil push-ups are very common um, things to prescribe for primary care optometrists in particular, although um, and been promoted as an efficient and effective home-based CI therapy. But studies are reported mixed results, and the CIT results were not, studies reported not great response, uh, results for pencil push-up therapy. So it's really not a great, um, even though it's really easy, not a great uh, thing we recommend for take-home um, vision therapy. So just, I want people to be aware of this. Really encourage you to read some of those really great CITT studies. Um, and that these studies have really shown, and other studies, not just the CITT studies, have shown that outpatient Slash office, so home and office based vision therapy is more effective than home based convergence exercises only, such as pencil push ups. So, just wanted you to be aware of this and what's out there in the literature. So, other considerations from these studies just really stressing good communication with your patient um, and the goals of vision therapy, continually stressing what the patient's problem is. Um, you're um, often working with children. It's a lot of work to do vision therapy. So you need to really stress, oh, your problem's tracking, that you're having problems focusing it near, and really, why are we doing this? Why is the vision therapy helping you? So they understand that they have this, this issue, and to reach the goals, they're really going to have to work at it. Um, make sure you're just stressing the changes occurring in the patient's visual system internally versus just the equipment. Patients are going to think, um, may think that they're getting better because of the equipment versus how they're training their eyes. So just stressing that subtle difference there. Um, just be aware of frustration levels with your patients. Fidgeting, um, avoiding the work might indicate that the, the techniques are a little bit too hard at the time. Um, we might need to make them a little bit easier. It's always good to start at an easier level or more baseline level and gradually increase the difficulty level so we're avoiding frustration. So how do we increase or decrease difficulty for our techniques? Um, this is just adding this extra component. If your patient's having trouble with any of these techniques, for divergence, we can increase the working distance, use some plus lenses or potentially based out prisms. And your, for convergence, basically the opposite um, to decrease the difficulty level, minus lenses based in prism, you can also increase the working distance. If we want to increase the difficulty level, say our patient's doing really well with just say our eccentric circles, and we want to increase the difficulty a little, little bit and we're tra currently training divergence, we can use some minus lenses or some base in prism or decrease that working distance to increase the difficulty level. And conversely, if we're gonna increase the, diff the difficulty of your convergence, you can use some plus lenses, base out prism, or decrease the working distance. So these are simple things to do if you kind of work through the program and you still wanna work with your patient a little bit, you can increase the difficulty level just simply using these methods or if they're having a little bit of trouble getting started with a particular technique, we can decrease the difficulty level. This just makes everything a little bit more flexible um, just considering these. 
So lastly, I'm just going to ask you the last poll question. For example, how would you increase the difficulty level of the PROC string procedure when treating a patient for CI? It would be add plus lenses, decrease the working distance, add base out prism, or all of the above. Good, and you could do all of the above. Um, and so I'm just giving you this. This is just really going through a, more of a three phase, more of a nitty gritty um, vision therapy for CI. CI, so I'm gonna just go through this quickly with the uh, um, idea that you can print this out or write this down and use this for your own use. This is based um, out of the CIT, based loosely on the CITT studies procedures. Um, and I modified a little bit to include just more simple um, or more simple and portable vision therapy training techniques. Um, I didn't get into stereoscopes um, or, or different booster stereoscopes, things like that, or tranoglyphs, for example, um, knowing that maybe not everyone has access to these. So really keeping things simple more from a primary care perspective. Um, so I'm just going to go through quickly through the, the three phases. Phase one is going to train that gross convergence. These are some of the different techniques you can use, um, rock string, lightsaber cards, loose lens accommodator rock, um, all monocular. So again, we're going to start with a gross convergence, um, do some of the more simple techniques for positive fusional convergence, and starting with um, monocular accommodative techniques. And then what you can use, which techniques you can give the patient for take-home therapy and the different endpoints. So when the patient's reaching these different endpoints, then we can slowly move on. Then we can move on to the next phase, which is phase two, which is just making things a little bit more difficult. So we're going to ramp the fusional virgins and monocular accommodative facility. We're going to introduce some more um, difficult techniques, such as eccentric circles, our flipper accommodator rock, letter chart accommodator rock. Um, still monocular, because our next step in phase three is to move everything binocularly. Again, the different techniques you can use for home VT to increase the difficulty level and the different goal points and the different endpoints for phase two that when the patient reaches, then we can proceed um, on to phase three. So phase three is when we're jumping from monocular status, we're ramping up the fusional virgins, we're making things more difficult, and then we're doing things binocularly instead of monocularly. Again, moving on to more difficult techniques, eccentric circles, we're gonna add in the loose prisms, and we're gonna move to binocular accommodative facility. Again, different things you can give to your patient to take home for home VT and just the endpoint. So this is the goal of this three-phase system is by the end, the patient will be able to reach all the goal points listed on, on this slide. So again, this is for you to um, use in your practice. Feel free to use as much as you like. Just wanted you to have a good um, example of a, a three-phase system. Most certainly read through the literature um, if you want to Emit certain techniques or add some of your own. If you have access to, for example, tranoglyphs, you can incorporate that into your vision therapy program. So I just wanted to open it up. We're at, we're at the end of the hour. Um, open it up for any questions you might have. Again, this is such a broad topic. Highly encourage you to, to read some of the, the resources um, I've given you here and feel free to use my slides to develop your, your own vision therapy program. Um, 
lots of different techniques. Just wanted to cover some of the more common binocular vision disorders. Didn't touch on amblyopia today. That's a whole other topic that I'd like to cover at some point. Um, but just giving you more from a primary care perspective. So I'm just going to open this up to any questions. Um, good question. Um, what are the minimum? What's the minimum equipment required for a binocular vision therapy clinic to start with? Um, Again, I would focus on things that are for convergence and sufficiency. That's one of the very, one of the most common things if you want to be able to um, have a vision therapy kit just specifically um, for convergence and sufficiency. That would be just a great starting point. You need some sort of loose lenses to do accommodative rock. Um, so that would be good or accommodative. Uh, Accommodative chart rock, um, also some sort of prisms to do vergences, the cards, rock string, all of these that I showed you today is just a good place to start. And if you want to focus mainly on treating convergence and sufficiency, that would be a great place to start, I think. Which, okay, good. That's great. Next question is. Which vision therapy do you advise for patients with computer vision syndrome? Um, good question. So computer vision syndrome is very, very broad. So I'd go back to my first two lectures and actually see if it's just overuse on the computer or if there's a true binocular vision um, disorder. So first you'd have to do a full binocular vision workup and see if there was a, an accommodative or emergence issue, what that is, and then you would focus on treating that specific condition. The next question, um, could vision therapy help in late age amblyopia and nystagmus? Potentially, yes. Again, this is a really large topic that I'm just not able to, to cover today, but there's some very good papers out on, on, on that topic. I'd love to cover that at some time. So I'm just um, not going to go into that right now. Good question. What is the next question is, what is the difference between binocular accommodative facility and amplitude? Um, I covered this in part two, I believe, part one or part two. Binocular accommodative facility is looking at how many cycles you can do with lenses. That's facility. Amplitude is when you're covering an eye and you're measuring how close the patient um, can bring the reading material. Okay. Uh, question is, what is the best way to deal with monocular diplopia? Interesting question. When you're talking about the visual system, monocular diplopia would, is um, not related um, to binocular vision disorders. Monocular diplopia would have to be something that's prior to the chiasm or the crossing of the, the fibers, the nerve fibers. Um, and that typically means doing a really good workup and looking to see if there's any macular disorders any um, ocular surface disorders because typically monocular diplopia is an issue with um, the eye. It's not related to BB. Good question. Um, what type of vision therapy? Oops. What type of vision therapy would you would I prefer for patients with reduced accommodative facility? Um, again, I would focus on the accommodation things for accommodative rule. First, we're going to rule out if it's accommodative insufficiency, and you might just prescribe plus in those cases. If it's um, a condition that's related to accommodation that's not necessarily accommodative insufficiency, um, I would work on the monocular and binocular accommodative techniques that I discussed, 
but you always don't want to just train accommodation without also working virgins. So you would encourage, um, or you would include some type of virgins um, training into your accommodation training as well. You don't want to just train the accommodative system without also training the virgin system as well. I think that might be it for the questions. Are there any other questions out there? Oh. Uh, I had one more question again. Why would it benefit the patient to learn how to see double? This is more just a feedback. It's not to see double, it's a feedback technique just so you can understand that they're performing vision therapy. Um, for example, a good example is the Brock string, just so they understand what double vision versus single vision is. Um, and so you want them to have single vision, you want them to fuse, but you want to also have them understand what double vision is, if that makes sense. Um, so appreciating what physiological diplopia is, what true double vision is, particularly this is more um, when maybe working with a child, and so they understand what double vision is, so they can report it to you when you're doing your training. <laughs> 